This is Duke University. My research is um, coming from an anthropological perspective, and it's both a critical um, analysis of global mental health, but also a constructive analysis. So what can anthropology contribute to improving global mental health um, research and practice? How can we have a better understanding of cultural models of mental illness, and how can that help inform global mental health research and practice? And what I'm going to talk about today are three things that kind of relate to cultural models. The first is, how can they help inform clinical communication and cross-cultural measurement of um, mental illness? The second is, how can cultural models inform care-seeking? How can they help us understand care-seeking? And the last is I'm going to look at cultural models of misfortune. So how do people make sense of misfortune? And that, of course, relates to how they seek care, how they kind of talk about uh, or communicate about misfortune. And so uh, I think to understand these interventions that are happening around um, global mental health, we have to put it in the context of Haiti's very deep history of intervention. Uh, it helps us understand that you know, Haitians see life as very precarious, and they see outside um, intervention very skeptically. Um, so I think this is really important to understand, um, this kind of historical context, the forms of structural violence that began and kind of are rooted in this deep history and that continue today, um, particularly when we look at things like availability of healthcare, um, education, um, things like that. So also out of this history grew a couple syncretic systems. One is the language Creole. Also, voodoo as a magical religious system is a combination of um, West African religions and um, Catholicism. So I'll talk a little bit about um, voodoo throughout. And I think what's important to note here is it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about voodoo in the sense of belief. So it's not kind of about is this you know, something you believe in or not, but that this is, these um, kind of supernatural forces are very much a part of life. It's just taken for granted that this is the reality. Um, this anthropological concept of idioms of distress Mark Nichter defines as socially and culturally resonant means of expressing and experiencing distress in local worlds. So what does that mean? Um, these are ways that people make sense of uh, and not only kind of talk about something, but actually fundamentally experience it. That it's not just looking for a different term for depression, for example, um, but actually trying to understand how people conceptualize and experience distress locally. And so in Haiti, one of the most common things that I saw um, what's called thinking too much, reflechit toi. And so thinking too much is literally you're just ruminating on one problem. You can't get it out of your head, you can't think about something else. It's thought about as actually really, um, potentially if you don't do anything about it, leading to something like psychosis. At the same time, thinking too much is a social critique. Um, so saying that you're experiencing thinking too much is pointing out social anxiety about lack of jobs, lack of hope, lack of future. Um, thinking too much, I think, then, is a really interesting example of where um, meaning matters, so paying attention to what people are saying that they're experiencing, using that terminology in a clinical setting, but also recognizing that it's not just about psychopathology, it's a social complaint, or it's a broader complaint about what's going on in the world. And so we actually looked at multiple idioms of distress, and we asked people kind of how these map onto the body. And what we found is a lot of the idioms um, in Haiti either refer to the head or the heart. People um, make sense of mental illness as being caused by spirits. Um, it's a supernatural causation. So this is a model. Mental illness is interpreted as caused by spirits. So people will go to the Ugan, the voodoo priest. Um, maybe they'll go also to a priest or pastor. Um, but certainly they're not going to go to a biomedical provider. So this is the model that people told us. Um, a lot of kind of expats, humanitarian workers, scholars said this. The reason we became interested in suicide is that the doctors um, told us very adamantly that suicide does not happen in Haiti. But then community members having very real examples of people they knew, their neighbors, their community members who had died by suicide. So why, is this, why is there this stark difference between you know, community members having all of these very real examples and providers saying, no, that's not something that happens here? And we came up with this sort of way of making sense of it. So for healthcare workers and community members, they have shared perceptions about um, what causes suicidal ideation. So why would someone think about suicide? But among people who expressed current suicidal ideation, they were eight times more likely to say that they would go to a community-based provider like a voodoo priest um, or another kind of community provider. So what we can add to our model here is, although community members are very much exposed to suicide, they're seeing this happening, they're hearing about it, 
the healthcare providers are not exposed to it because people are not presenting at the clinic if they're experiencing suicidal ideation. Um, so I think these differences in exposure um, is what kind of explains these differences in terms of understandings of suicide. But when we look at this model that we were told about mental illness, I think it actually works in terms of understanding suicide. That people think about it as being about spirits. So this is sent by a spirit. So they go to these um, providers who can do something about spirits, like voodoo priests and priests and pastors. So the final thing I'll talk about is cultural models of misfortune, um, this idea that spirits can be sent to you or you can, have, you can experience harm by the spirit world. So I called this spiritual insecurity. So the idea of kind of insecurity in relation to the spirit world. You can't control it, you can't know about it. I thought that was gonna be related with worse mental health outcomes. Um, what I found is among people experiencing a high degree of daily stressors, everyone has really high depression scores, so high is worse, um, regardless of whether they have um, kind of high spiritual insecurity or low spiritual insecurity. For people in this low category, which again, this is still Haiti, this is not an easy life, but it's a little bit lower than other people, um, having high spiritual insecurity is actually associated with better mental health outcomes. So this is the opposite of what I expected. I thought that people who kind of saw, you know, I can't control anything in life, you know, or at least in terms of the spirit world, would have worse mental health outcomes, but they actually have better. Really when we reflect on um, how these, these narratives of the social world and the spirit world are really mapping onto each other, so that what's happening in the spirit world is a reflection of these inequalities um, and kind of limitations in the social world, it helps us to um, bring together or unify these um, ideas of solidarity, um, but with the kind of social control that the sense spirit narratives represent. And what we've seen across settings globally is that um, paying attention to idioms of distress and actually using that in our communication can improve um, care seeking. So it can actually help with recruitment into global mental health interventions. It can improve retention in those interventions. Um, and it can reduce stigma. Um, in terms of care seeking behavior, again, I think understanding cultural models shows us where there might be a space for intervention. And then finally, paying attention to cultural models of misfortune, I think, reminds us that even though we're often really focused on this clinical setting or, you know, one intervention, that we have to be thinking about these broader forms of um, social inequality and structural violence that our patients are seeing um, and kind of facing. And Thanks, Bonnie, for a really rich uh, presentation. So I wanted to ask you about gender and the burden of mental health uh, disease, because a lot of your examples seem to focus on women. So you could you help us understand a little bit about the relationship between mental health and gender in Haiti? You know, scores for dep the depression screener and anxiety screen and whatnot were across the board higher among women. Um, and it, I'm working on a new project right now with Family Health Ministries that's really trying to tease apart um, these different experiences and what it is that's particularly gendered about um, specifically causation um, for kind of mental distress. And a lot of what women talk about is, um, you know, it's about being in an environment where you are economically dependent on your partner and he's expecting you to have kids. And if you don't, he's gonna leave you. Um, so there's this lack of reproductive autonomy. Um, and then all of these kind of child rearing stressors. Um, and so, that's sort of the context of how they're conceptualizing where their stress and their limited agency is coming from. But what we were thinking about is like, where can there be a couple's intervention so that they're, they're talking about reproductive health decisions because it doesn't seem to be happening at all right now. Um, but there, there actually is a space for shared decision making and communication um, and that men actually seems to be open to that idea. Um, so obviously there's a, space where you know things will be unacceptable and you'll actually cause harm by intervening. So we're trying to avoid that you know, and figure out where is there actually room or elasticity for these things to change. And we haven't totally figured it out yet, um, but I think that's one space where we're exploring it more. And